Let me ask you next then, uh, we increasingly have patients who progress on a PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitor. Um, what do you then do? And, and I guess lung map covers that a little bit, but you know, expand a bit yes on that. Yes and no. So, so you know, I was uh, uh, thinking about this with some people this morning. You know, you look at the phenomenal progress we've made in lung cancer. Uh, Ten years ago, not five years ago, to think that we had uh, immunotherapy now and that we're using it in patients without, uh, in pretty much all patients, and, and they're all benefiting to some extent. But you know, what we have to remember is that it's really only about 10% of the patients who have those amazing responses and many have uh, activity and then they progress. And, and the problem is what do we do in that setting? And that, that really is a challenge and I think we all face that. Uh, certainly you have to look at, at, at how someone has progressed. So there, there are different groups. So if someone's uh, received an IO therapy and they haven't uh, benefited at all, in fact the tumor has progressed, I think that's one group versus a group of patients who might have stable disease or minor response or even response and then they progress. So I think you have to look at it in two, in, in two different groups. For the patients who get a PD-L1 inhibitor uh, and they, they progress you know, rapidly, um, the standard there would be to give chemotherapy. Interestingly, we've seen and there have been some reports at ASCO last year, higher than expected response rates for certain chemotherapies in that setting. Uh, mechanism not completely known, but certainly chemotherapy would be worth a try. We also talked about how chemotherapy plus IO combos might be, might be reasonable, and I think that's important. Uh, and then, of course, you know, some sort of uh, immune combination. And what we like to do at Yale is we like to re-biopsy those patients. And um, we're in the process of trying to adapt trials based on what we see on, on that biopsy. But for in, in common practice, I think chemotherapy or some sort of early phase trial. Then, of course, there are the patients who have had some response, and then they progress. And for that group, that's the group, actually, uh, that I think LungMap will focus most on. And there you have to ask, you know, why is someone not responding? You know, so um, is it because, you know, PD-L1 doesn't drive their tumor, you know, and that, that's probably about 25% of the cases, and that's where there might be another checkpoint in play, uh, let's say LAG-3, TIM-3. Maybe they're part of the 40% where the tumor is non-inflamed. Uh, you know, we, we described that in a, a paper not long ago as the immune desert, or, or they might have what we call immune excluded, where the T cells are there but they don't get through. And in those cases, you have to think about what can you do to sort of prime that, that situation. And uh, many interesting things going on right now, Everett, uh, from PARP inhibitors um, in combination uh, to um, pegylated interleukins uh, to the VEGF uh, inhibitors. Uh, we have interesting uh, phase one data with uh, ramasurumab, the VEGFR2 agent that many of us have worked with uh, in combination with pembrolizumab uh, that hopefully will go forward uh, to some, some more confirmatory trials. So it really is going to take a lot of, uh, a lot of effort to, to figure this out. Uh, and I think it's, it's great that we've seen so much benefit from immune therapy, but there's, this chapter is just the first chapter of, of, of many, many to come. And it is going to take, in my opinion, a little bit more science you know, to do that. We're going to have to work in both directions. Some reverse translation, treating patients with these combinations and working back, but also trying to generate things forward from the laboratory and whatever animal models exist uh, in this, in this uh, tumor type. But, you know, I have a very active phase one group at, at my center, as I know all of you do, and uh, we're, we're testing probably about 20 or 25 different combinations now, um, which means we really don't know what we're doing. So uh, it's really time to sort of figure it out, you know, and scientifically. We yeah, it, it, it reminds me a little bit about, you know, what used to be described as alphabet soup with uh, chemotherapy agents where uh, they did have different mechanisms of action and people actually were trying to be scientific about it. But in the end, it was just empirical combinations. And uh, I am not sure that we are that much better at this point, although I think reverse translation is what, uh, what will likely be most informative. Uh, yeah, since what, the trials are already ongoing. What is important, uh, though, is uh, Everett, that today when we do clinical trials, that we uh, ensure that uh, the clinical trials has a sufficient uh, translational uh, components and we include uh, this type of research into the clinical trials. Yeah. Uh, I think that is strongly needed today. You know, we, ha we have had a tradition uh, for doing you know, just clinical trials, just focus on the clinical parameters 
uh, while we these days need to to really implement translational research into our clinical trials.